We live in an age of information overload, bombarded with news from all corners of the globe. But amidst this deluge, how do we discern truth from fabrication, facts from propaganda? When it comes to international conflicts, the media plays a crucial role in shaping our understanding, but it's a role fraught with complexities and often hidden agendas. Michel Colon argues that the media, often unwittingly, becomes a tool for manufacturing consent for war. He highlights how news outlets, particularly those with close ties to governments or corporate interests, frame narratives in ways that demonize the enemy and portray interventions as necessary and righteous. This manufacturing of consent operates on several levels. Firstly, selective reporting and omission of key facts can create a skewed image of the situation. We see this when media coverage focuses solely on the atrocities committed by one side while downplaying or ignoring those committed by the other. The historical context of conflicts is often simplified or ignored entirely, leading to a black and white portrayal of good versus evil. Secondly, the language used in reporting can be incredibly influential. Terms like collateral damage sanitize the killing of civilians, while phrases like surgical strikes create an illusion of precision and control, masking the devastating reality of war. Additionally, the constant repetition of certain terms, such as rogue state or terrorist, can lead to a subconscious acceptance of these labels, shaping our perception of entire populations. Thirdly, the voices and perspectives included in media coverage play a significant role. We often hear from government officials, military experts, and pundits who support interventionist policies, while the voices of those directly impacted by the conflict or those who oppose intervention are marginalized or silenced. This creates an echo chamber where dissenting opinions are rarely heard, leading to a false sense of consensus and public support for military action. Let's not forget the influence of media ownership. Many major news outlets are owned by large corporations or individuals with vested interests in maintaining the status quo. This can lead to self-censorship and a reluctance to challenge the dominant narrative, even when it contradicts the facts on the ground. The NATO game, according to Colin, relies heavily on this media manipulation to garner public support for interventions. By controlling the narrative, powerful interests can manufacture a sense of urgency, fear, and even moral obligation paving the way for military action with minimal resistance. However, reducing the motives behind international interventions to mere propaganda and media manipulation would be an oversimplification. We must also delve deeper into the realm of economics, where resources, trade routes, and the pursuit of profit often intertwine with geopolitical ambitions. The NATO game, as Colin describes it, is not just about spreading democracy or protecting human rights. It's about securing access to vital resources like oil, gas, and minerals, which are essential for maintaining economic dominance. Controlling strategic trade routes and pipelines is another crucial factor, as it allows Western powers to dictate the flow of resources and exert influence over global markets. Corporations play a significant role in this equation. Multinational companies, with their vast economic power and lobbying influence, often push for policies that favor their interests, even if those policies lead to instability or conflict in other parts of the world. The revolving door between government and corporate positions further strengthens this link, as individuals move between roles, carrying their biases and agendas with them. The concept of disaster capitalism also comes into play. This refers to the practice of exploiting crises and conflict zones for profit. As Colin argues, Wars and instability create opportunities for reconstruction contracts, resource extraction deals, and the privatization of essential services. Companies stand to gain from these situations, while the local populations often bear the brunt of the consequences. While the human cost is often downplayed or ignored in the pursuit of profit, it's crucial to acknowledge the devastating impact of conflict on civilian populations. This leads us to the next segment, where we will explore the human cost of the NATO game and examine the consequences for those caught in the crossfire. Beyond the economic machinations and geopolitical chess moves, it's essential to remember that war is not a game. It's a brutal reality for those who experience it firsthand, particularly civilian populations caught in the crossfire. 
The NATO game has a devastating human cost, leaving behind a trail of physical and psychological scars that can last for generations. One of the most immediate and horrific consequences is the loss of innocent lives. Civilian casualties are often dismissed as collateral damage, but behind this sanitized term lies the tragedy of shattered families, orphaned children, and communities torn apart. Even those who survive the initial violence face the ongoing threat of unexploded ordnance, landmines, and the lingering effects of toxic pollutants. Displacement is another major issue, as conflict forces millions to flee their homes in search of safety. Refugee camps become breeding grounds for disease and despair, while host countries struggle to cope with the influx of displaced populations. The loss of homes, livelihoods, and social networks has a profound impact on individuals and communities, leading to long-term trauma and social disintegration. The psychological effects of war are equally devastating. Living under constant threat, witnessing violence, and experiencing the loss of loved ones can lead to severe mental health problems like post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, and depression. Children are particularly vulnerable as exposure to war at a young age can have lasting impacts on their development and well-being. The NATO game also disrupts social structures and institutions, leaving lasting scars on the fabric of society. Education systems collapse, healthcare systems become overburdened, and infrastructure is destroyed, making it difficult for communities to rebuild and recover long after the conflict has ended. Furthermore, the influx of weapons and the rise of armed groups can lead to an increase in violence, crime, and instability even after the initial conflict subsides. This creates a vicious cycle of poverty, desperation, and resentment, making it even harder to achieve lasting peace and reconciliation. While the NATO game often focuses on specific regions and conflicts, it's crucial to understand the broader context of a shifting global power dynamic. We are witnessing the emergence of a multipolar world, where new players challenge the dominance of traditional Western powers. Countries like China, Russia, and India are asserting themselves on the world stage economically, politically, and militarily. This shift in the balance of power has significant implications for the future of international relations and the role of organizations like NATO. The unipolar world, where the United States and its allies held unquestioned hegemony, is gradually giving way to a more complex and competitive landscape. This raises questions about the effectiveness and legitimacy of NATO as a tool for maintaining global security, particularly when its interventions are often seen as serving Western interests rather than promoting genuine cooperation and collective security. The rise of alternative institutions such as the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and BRICS further challenges the established order and offers a different vision for international cooperation. These organizations emphasize economic development, regional security, and respect for national sovereignty, often presenting a stark contrast to the interventionist approach favored by NATO. The nations, designed as a forum for international cooperation and conflict resolution, faces its own challenges in this evolving landscape. Its effectiveness is often hampered by the veto power held by the five permanent members of the Security Council, reflecting the power dynamics of the post-World War II era. Reforming the UN to make it more representative and responsive to the needs of a multipolar world is a complex but necessary task. As new power centers emerge and global alliances shift, it's essential to reevaluate the role of military interventions and consider alternative approaches to conflict resolution. Dialogue, diplomacy, and economic cooperation should take precedence over military solutions, which often exacerbate tensions and create long-term instability. The NATO game, with its intricate web of economic interests, geopolitical maneuvering, and media manipulation, can seem overwhelming and leave us feeling powerless. However, it's important to remember that we, as individuals and as a collective, have the power to challenge the status quo and demand a more just and peaceful world. The first step is awareness. By critically examining the information we consume and questioning the narratives presented to us, we can break free from the shackles of propaganda and develop a more nuanced understanding of international conflicts. Seeking diverse perspectives, engaging in open discussions, and supporting independent media are crucial steps in this process.
Active citizenship is equally important. We cannot simply be passive observers of the NATO game. Engaging in political discourse, holding our leaders accountable, and advocating for peaceful solutions to conflict are essential for creating lasting change. This can take many forms, from participating in protests and petitions to contacting our elected officials and supporting organizations that promote peace and human rights. Education plays a vital role in fostering critical thinking and empowering future generations to become agents of change. We must equip young people with the tools to analyze information, challenge assumptions, and engage in constructive dialogue. Encouraging empathy, understanding, and respect for diverse cultures is also crucial for building a more peaceful and inclusive world. Beyond individual actions, we must also consider systemic changes that can address the root causes of conflict. This includes promoting economic justice, reducing inequality, and ensuring equitable access to resources. It also means addressing the underlying issues of poverty, environmental degradation, and social injustice that often fuel tensions and lead to violence. By fostering a culture of peace, prioritizing diplomacy over military solutions, and holding powerful actors accountable, we can work towards a world where cooperation and mutual understanding replace the zero-sum game of power politics. The NATO game may be complex, but by recognizing its mechanisms and choosing to play a different game, we can collectively strive for a future where peace prevails. The world may indeed resemble a complex chessboard with powerful players vying for dominance and pawns caught in the crossfire. Yet, unlike a game with predetermined rules and predictable outcomes, we the people have the power to reshape the board, challenge the players, and rewrite the rules of engagement. Let us not be mere spectators in the NATO game. Let us instead become active participants in shaping a future where cooperation, understanding, and respect for human dignity form the foundation of a truly peaceful and just world. Remember, the power to change the game lies not with the elite few, but within each and every one of us. Thank you for joining me on this journey of exploration and reflection. I encourage you to continue questioning, researching, and engaging in conversations that challenge the status quo and inspire hope for a better tomorrow. Together, let's build a world where peace is not just a dream, but a reality.